Hi, I'm Peggy Farron, and we are live with the Understand Photography Show, where we talk about travel, nature, and fine art photography. Welcome to episode 66. Today, we are going to talk to Nikon USA Senior Manager of Pro Relations, instructor and photographer Mike Corrado. But first, let me just tell you, um, if you are a local person to Southwest Florida, Mike is going to be speaking tomorrow at 9 a.m., which tomorrow is December... 16th? 16th. Yeah. So December 16th, 2017. He's going to be speaking here in Naples, Florida at the so Florida Southwestern College campus on Collier County. Collier County campus. I'll get that together for the local camera club. That, and that is called, we call it Dippy SIG, but it stands for Digital Photography Imaging Special Interest Group. So the website for Dippy SIG is www dpi-sig.org if you want more information. So come and uh, hear Mike speak tomorrow. Please. Now, if you haven't finished your Christmas shopping, remember you, a gift certificate from Understand Photography is a wonderful gift. We've got private lessons here in Southwest Florida. We also do Skype private lessons if you're not in Southwest Florida. The Four Weeks to Proficiency in Photography is our signature course that's going to give you a good foundation in photography. You're going to learn how to shoot in the manual class it, in the first class, okay? Uh, composition, lighting, including flash, and then some technical stuff at the end. So in four weeks, you'll have a pretty solid foundation. So that's a live online class. So you have a live teacher while you're taking the class. You have homework and you have to do it. You can't just shove it on the shelf because you won't be forgotten about. <laughs> So it's kind of like hands-on, but it's online. Um, and then we also have some Lightroom classes that Joe Fitzpatrick put together and Photoshop. You'll see. We've got cell phone classes, a lot of different things that you can give a gift certificate for um, or just buy it for yourself for a holiday present. Why not? Um, we also have three trips coming up this spring. First one is in January. It's not sold out yet. That's our Everglades trip. Joe Fitzpatrick leads a four-day Everglades trip. He does it every year. We live here. We live in the Everglades, so we know it. Joe is really a good instructor. He's got it down. Uh, it's heavily uh, uh, heavy emphasis on bird photography, but there's also a little bit of everything in that workshop. Then Joe's leading a trip to the Forgotten Coast of Florida, which is up in the Panhandle. And I don't know if you've watched my show. You know when I discovered that area. I fell in love. It is so beautiful there. So that is a five-day trip. It includes a boat trip uh, to Dead Lakes, which is awesome. Um, you're going to see white squirrels. You're going to see the oyster men. They're famous for oysters up in that area. So that's April 16th through the 20th, 2018. And then I'm going to do one of my women's weekends here in Naples, Florida, May 4th through the 6th. It's just a weekend and only, only available to three ladies. So check out our website at understandphotography.com for all that stuff. So today we're going to talk to Mike Corrado. Mike recently celebrated his 35th anniversary with Nikon. years, yep. Man, Long he time. must be an old guy, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I started very young when I was three. Yeah. It's been, it's been a great role, though. I'm 38 years old. 38? Yeah, I love Going it. Going on 55, I think. Oh, jeez. All right, I'm, gonna, I'm not done with your bio. <laughs> <laughs> Mike has traveled the world for Nikon, and he's the house photographer for Long Island's Northwest Health at Jones Beach Theater. That was hard to say. As North, Northwell Health. Northwell at Health. Beach Theater. At Jones it's a Beach mouthful. Theater. It's a mouthful. And you're the house photographer of the yes. Ronald Mon Mon McDonald House in Long Island. Which is, to me, the, the gift of all gifts. If I was going to be a house photographer anywhere, the Ronald McDonald House well, do you is want where to it's at. Let's start with that then. Sure. Even though that's nothing that I have in there yet. <laughs> <laughs> Are you done with the bio, though? I'm I done with your wanna, bio. I don't want to step on your bio. If I want to <laughs> keep doing your bio, I'll have to be talking for like oh, three gosh. hours because you have done a lot and you have a lot going on. You have a lot of energy. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> But you know this. This is an addiction. This isn't just a passion. It's yeah, something but you that are really... it consumes you, right? Um, I, I really do believe there's chemistry in our body that if we're not taking pictures, it starts to get to us over a few days' time, and we have to go create, right? But uh, starting, I mean, which is a great place. I was there last night with my daughter for a tree lighting ceremony. The Ron McDonald oh. House in Long Island kind of found me through Nikon. Nikon 
uh, sponsors the house, started sponsoring it about, uh, I guess, eight years ago. And along the way, they had said every year, let's go out and take some portraits of these kids and um, do it in the spring, do it in the fall, set them up for the holidays. We just did a holiday photo shoot a, a couple of weeks back. And it's probably the thing that has changed everything in my world. Okay, and I'm going to back up a little bit. Ronald, okay, now my brother has a child who's had a lot of health issues, so mm -hmm. I'm very familiar with Ronald McDonald House, but maybe the rest of the yeah. audience isn't. So what sure. do they do there? Uh, the Ronald McDonald House is just that. It's a house that has a bunch of rooms, like a hotel, uh -huh. and they house people who come to the neighboring hospitals that are going in for surgeries or spending time, you know, could be months, um, you know, getting treatments or going through surgeries or going through... One of my subjects, Dylan, went through bone marrow transplant and was there for quite a while. And they, now it's uh, adults and children? Yeah, it's a charity house and it's run on donations and uh, they have an amazing committee that I photographed last night. And uh, they uh, basically volunteers, it's all run through volunteers that come in that cook, that help clean, that help cater to all the needs of these people coming in. Because imagine the kids are sick and you are the parent of a sick child the comfort that the parent needs as well. Yeah. So Ron McDonald House Charities, they're all over the world, um, but uh, on Long Island they have uh, Stony Brook House and the Ron McDonald House in New Hyde Park that I work with okay. or became the house photographer for. Okay, okay. Yeah. All right, so what do you do as a house photographer? Anything and everything. Okay. If there's an event, there's a walk, there's a party like last night, I'm shooting pictures for them. And, uh, and they use them for publicity? Is that what? Yeah, it's, and that's, that's the amazing thing. Uh, in fact, I ran into one of the parents last night whose child we photographed sitting on a huge teddy bear is the cover photo when you go to the page. Oh. Um, and so, yeah, they, they use them in, in a very positive way. You know, and that's what you have to think of as a photographer is that you're making these pictures and you don't want it to be something that's gratuitous or something that just is misleading. You're taking these pictures of these sick children because it drives donations. Okay. And at first you feel a little weird about that, like, do I want to post that on my Facebook page or my Instagram page? Do I want to socialize that? And then all of a sudden you realize a few hundred people will sign in and look at that. And, and now even Facebook has a little donation button. You put it on and all of a sudden, you know, three, four hundred dollars in donations just by posting a picture and say, hey, if you got a few bucks, donate. But they live off five and ten dollar donations. Wow! So wow. now this is Ronald McDonald House, Long Island. Long Island. Would right. that be their website too? Um, yep. Okay. Yep. Ronald McDonald House. But of Long your Island. Facebook page is what? I am. Uh, my Facebook page is Corrado Photo. Corrado Photo. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. so they might see last night's picture. Uh, if they went to they will eventually when I edit it and oh, post okay, it. Oh, <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Last night, you mean you're not done Last yet? Last night, came here, Where jumped on pictures? a plane because there's this amazing <laughs> photographer, Peggy, that runs this great <laughs> show, Understand Photography, and, and I needed to be here. So. But I will edit tonight in my room. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, uh, so that, how long have you been doing that? Um, it's about, about eight years now. And, eight uh, years? Yeah, if wow. you do come to this program tomorrow, you'll see the transition of how Everything else I've done in photography, especially in rock and roll, has sort of melded into an idea that uh, uh, basically I've worked with drummers in, in this Drummer Love Project, and the drummer doesn't get the photographs unless they make a donation to the house. So I'm not looking oh. for any money, or I'm not looking to, to make money from these pictures, but they have to lay down a donation to the house. And Drew Scholl of Train and some of the bigger bands I've worked with, Daniel Dare of Nickelback, were, were great enough to, to lay down donations. So. And that's, that's a great, so it's still finding its way oh, in, in the way of projects. Idea. But it's, and these uh, drummers, these are you photograph very famous bands, right? Um, I mean, yeah. The, this is when you're talking about the Jones. Is it Jones? What Jones is it? Jones Beach Nikon? Theater is the Jones easiest Beach. way to say it. Yeah, Jones it used Beach. to be the Nikon at Jones Beach Theater, and then it was bought out by Northwell Health, who oh, basically that's owns why everything. Northwell Health. Yes. Okay. I because yeah. I was thinking I didn't think that was the name of it, but yeah. I don't. I'm not. Which from is that how area. I got attached to uh, Live Nation is through Nikon, and uh, we would shoot concerts and we would post pictures on a site called Nikon Live, and I became addicted to photographing rock and roll. I mean, there's nothing more fun than being able to put your eye up to a camera and you're listening to the music and the music is what's driving you and that's what kind of drove me to this project with drummers because I'm five foot six in a pit trying to photograph a drummer. Have you ever been to a show 
My where son is, is a drummer. My son is a rock and roll musician. And you know, anytime he's a solo act now, but when he had the full band, I would always try to get the drummer because I felt sorry for the drummers never mm. get in the pictures, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and because they sit in the back of the stage where they're I on know. a riser. And, I and now know. imagine this five foot six dude in the pit trying to go up like this. And then there's every cymbal stand and pipe and, oh, and, yeah. and, and cymbal itself and, and, and cameras and all these obstructions between you and the drummer. So usually you may get a face or you get a, a hand with a stick popping out. And back in the days of photographing sports and using remote cameras where you put remote cameras in places you just couldn't physically stand at a sporting event, um, it was actually Daniel Darren Nickelback that when we were working with them during a Dark Horse tour, I had asked the question, can I mount a camera on your drum kit? And we did it and it was okay and we did it two weeks later and it got even better and um, and now it sort of kind of went crazy for me in about uh, 18 or so drummers later. Um, now you put many cameras around the drummer, yeah, right? Yeah, it started with one, then we went to two and I've done as many as nine. Uh, nine cameras? Around the kit. Where do you put them? You mount them, it, especially if the kit, a drum kit has a frame work uh, okay. that you mount on, but you're mounting on cymbal stands, you're mounting on the framework, you're mounting on you know any kind of structure that may be around the drummer oh so you get gosh. from behind you get from the sides the intent is to really wrap the drummer with as many cameras as I can and always look for that perfect moment where all let's just say there's eight cameras mounted all eight cameras hit one moment at the same time and it's a perfect picture from every angle oh I haven't done that gosh. yet that hasn't worked yet. so I live with just those beautiful moments and do you ever see um, when a pilot in a fighter jet turns a camera back on themselves with a wide angle uh -huh. so their hero shot is what they call it I wanted to take that mentality to the photographing drummers and uh, to create that beautiful hero shot with like a 16 fisheye or this the, the new 8 to okay. 15 zoom fisheye and just make them feel good yeah. Nikon has a zoom fisheye zoom fisheye yeah 8 to 15 for full frame I'm assuming mm -hmm. wow that's cool <laughs> yeah and, and what that does is gives you just sort of that old school circular or you can zoom in and fill the frame and wow. uh, that gives me a lot of flexibility there but it creates that hero shot of the drummer and because of that when the front performers the people in the front of the stage I don't mm -hmm. know where your son plays in the band he's uh, the lead guy yeah. yeah so the lead guys always get the pictures yeah right? I know the drummers don't. So, I know. So we connected, Daniel and I, and, and it was funny because the second time I photographed Daniel, a drummer from another band, a great friend of mine, a Floridian from Jacksonville, uh, Barry Kirch from a band called Shinedown, okay. had been sitting behind us during sound check, and he saw me mounting the cameras, and he turned to me and said, what are you doing with that camera? Are you shooting movies with it? And I said, no, but how did you know it shot, shot movies? It was a D300S that actually came out with a movie mode. And uh, he says, no, because I own the camera. And so, oddly enough, Daniel was a photographer, a hobbyist. Uh -huh. Barry was a photographer, and all of a sudden this connection of, well, wait a minute here. I can offer them tips in photography. They offer me the access, and let's just try to drive this home. And, and again, it just sort of evolved from one to two to four to six to eight to nine cameras. And now I try to limit it. Um, you don't need nine cameras to make a great picture. <laughs> That's absurd. I mean, it really is, unless it's something epic. Um, when Steve Smith, Journey's drummer, came back to play with the band, uh -huh. um, that was a pretty epic moment. So I, I will load a kit with as many cameras as I can for moments like that. Now, I have never shot remotely, mm -hmm. so how does that work? We actually have a system, the WR system. So okay. it's a tiny little remote that goes into the 10-pin port of our, our cameras. Okay. And then there's a WR1. It's a transceiver. So I just plug that in to my main camera, and when I fire off the main camera, all the cameras fire off. The receivers pick up that main transmission so and fire off. So just like off. your flashes, same yeah, type of thing. same type of thing. If they're on Only the same channel, they all go off at the same time, but exactly. you could you do you could do different channels to, you I'm going to shoot this one, then this one. Right, and I, I, I'd have to, I, I would probably be in a lot of trouble if I didn't say, uh, most recently my daughter joined me on this venture. Oh, how um, cool. She doesn't mind being with the band she loves, like Florida Georgia Line. How old is she? Train. She's uh, 25, and oh, she's a she nurse. Oh, she probably and, loves and, it. And of course, she pushes the button, I set up the cameras, and she wants all the credit, which, ah! <laughs> in a way, she deserves. Um, but, but I've kind of even broken away. My thought was I could be shooting the show and all the front people, and every time I fire the camera, the drum's going off. Ah. So to me, and I would say this of anybody doing any kind of photography, study what you're about to photograph. So right. if it's a band train that I just did recently, take a step back, listen to the music, try to find the song set, and you know where the inflections of the music are, so you know when the drummer's going to make a move. It's a okay. very soft song. Stop shooting. 
You know, uh, the drummer's not going to be moving so much. But when the, the beat picks up, and that's why I feel like that. This is where I kind of get connected with the whole drum thing and the heartbeat, because we're driven by beats, right? The faster uh, the beat, the faster we move. The slower the beat, the more relaxed we are. So there's a whole psychological thing to it for me as well. Okay. But that's what draws me to the drummers. Is I th I think they carry the the pace of of the entire show. They do. You know? They definitely um, do. Guitarists may argue with that. I, I get that. You but. you get some amazing shots. I love the ones with the hair all flying all good. over the place. Dreadlocks, yeah. Barry they... Kirch of uh, Shine Down Has Dreads, uh, Birdie, um, Brian Bird of uh, a band called Soja Reggae Has Dreads. Um, it was not a good moment when I asked him to take the rubber band out and the dread started flying so much it made it hard for him to drum. You can't move the sticks through the hair when it's coming oh. through, which is why he never wanted to do it in the first place. But we have some amazing stories. Again, coming to the Naples show, I have a picture of Ryan who at the end of every show jumps up and one of the wide angle cameras from low angle has him totally airborne and the gels in the background and the lights went off on the wall and just you can't make that stuff happen. Okay, it's, so it's when you, so you've together. got these cameras all set, now you only use only four. Yeah, four or five. Four or five. <laughs> but, you know, listen, and, That's and, one and of the benefits for working for Nikon, right? Yes, but, but I will say, 35 years in the company, you, you have worked very hard for certain privileges, and, and I never take the gear away from any, say, NPS member that needs to borrow. Right. If a gig happens, typically on a Friday, if the gear is not out, I'll go down and say what's in the locker, and um, and I'll borrow it for the night and bring it back. No, the I'm same not. Night. No, I am a Canon shooter, so it's I'm not okay. making a commercial for Nikon. I can't Nikon, blame everybody for but... shooting Canon. I mean, just you know those those people that do. I have a lot of Nikon friends, but I like Canon people. But I just want to clarify: NPS is Nikon Professional, professional Services. Professional Services, yes, you're correct. And what that is is we're Nikon professionals. If you join this club. Mm -hmm then you can actually borrow equipment. Yeah, it's, it's really not even joining a club. If you okay. buy, uh, if you're a full-time working pro, uh -huh. um, and you buy uh, professional bodies and professional lenses, and who are we to designate what is what, but we have a category of, of cameras and lenses and a point system of, of what you buy, and, and it's a free service. It, you know, we feel like what you want to do is give back to your customers. You don't want to charge them for a faster service. You don't want to charge them for uh, repair loans. You don't want to charge them for you know things that will keep their business running. You know, if you're out there and you're shooting and a camera goes down and you're relying on two cameras to run your business, to have one FedExed overnight is not a horrible thing, okay. um, and expedited repairs. So really, it's it's a privilege that's given to full-time working pros that have you know the right. So basically, gear. they have to qualify. They have to qualify. But then it's free. Correct. And they can borrow equipment. They can borrow equipment, limited loans. They can do special assignment loans. Certainly, repair loans are the ones that mean the most because we want to keep those people. Those so this NPS running. Nikon Professional Services has a has just a a little. I was going to call it a library. <laughs> what so am I trying to stock? It's a, it's a locker of gear. Okay. Yep. And so that's where you borrow the equipment from. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, and is it so? Is it based in New York? Is that why it's easy for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's oh. right in the basement of where I work, so it, it does oh, work. Oh, that's out. nice. Yeah, because what if you But were again, I just want to reiterate how hard I have worked for 35 years <laughs> um, to be in the position I'm in. But that's where it all turns around. And with all, all kidding aside, how how I trying to figure out how you turn this around to make money for a charity. How you how you put these things together to all of a sudden have, you know, I was just with Drew Scholes of Train. I, the, that night, the, the last night we worked together, I immediately put down a donation for you. And I have no problem giving them the images. Now, That's of course, a great idea. if they use them commercially and they start to profit from the images, then we have to have another conversation. But promotional uses um, and anything that helps promote the Ronald McDonald House, I'm, I'm, I'm in for. So. That's such a great idea. It puts everything in perspective, and I don't mean that as a photography term. When you're working with these kids, you learn about life that you never even know existed. Yeah. And it's, it's amazing. Yeah. That's, it's, I know my brother's, you know, her, his daughter was born with a lot of health issues, and, you know, they... You know, they live fairly close to Detroit, so mm -hmm. it wasn't that far away to go home. Mm -hmm. But a lot of families, I mean, she was in the hospital for weeks and months at a time, yeah. and a lot of families would just stay there in the house so they could be right by the hospital near there. And he did sometimes. I mean, they were only about a 45-minute drive away, so it wasn't Still too 40, bad for 45 them. 45 minutes. When you're thinking about what has to happen maybe during a surgery, now you're talking 90 minutes both yeah. ways. And just having that place to go rest or shower, you know. Well, um, plus they're working still. Mm -hmm. You can't just stop working because your kid is sick. Right. You and know, you still have to go to work every day. So 45-minute drive each way, that's yeah. a lot of extra work on top of your ten or 9 or 10-hour work day. You I know? feel as much for the parents as I do the yeah. children and the yeah. parents. And when you're older, we, we're more conscious of things that our kids are going through. 
and the kids themselves, they kind of know something's going on, but they don't have the perspective of, of an adult, right. so they see it from a totally different place. They're not so bothered by it um, until it becomes something that's a hindrance. But again, like I said before, it's it's a learning experience every day, and they, they eat your heart. You know, yeah. they just I, my, I, I, I just fall in love with every one of these kids because you make the connection with them, which was a big turnaround for me, huge turnaround. Because when I first started doing these portraits, I kind of went in with this sort of very hard, I'm going to not know their names. I don't want to know what they're sick from. I don't want to cry, and I don't want to feel the pain. I don't want to know what the prognosis is, and I don't want to know what happens, which was the biggest mistake I could have ever made. Because you make a nice portrait, but it's a very staged, right. flat portrait. It wasn't until a young lady named Bailey, I believe she's 21 now, she just got married, and um, uh, I had known her, brother, her mother Brenda for quite a while, and when you go to the house and you have surgery, especially if you have um, something that involves the head, your head gets shaved, what 21-year-old oh, yeah. woman wants to have their head shaved, yeah. and she wasn't feeling really good, and when I talked to the mother, I said, give me five minutes, five minutes, and I'll make her feel great. And we did that, and we photographed her. And all you needed was her eyes looking up towards the light, and she lit up. And it didn't matter whether her hair was shaved. Um, there's not a person that sees the picture doesn't see how beautiful she is without hair. And that made her feel, I guess, a lot different, a lot better yeah. about what the situation was. And ironically, that day of shooting, another little boy named Dylan had come in. The mom, Teresa, came in, and uh, she said, I missed one of your portrait sessions. Can you photograph Dylan? And I said, of course I can. Now you start to have to deal with, he's uh, five years old, neuroblastoma, cancer, um, neurological cancer, two bone marrow transplants, oh. and, um, and he had not been on an easy road. This was something that I actually went to friends and journalists about and said, how do I deal with this? Because it wasn't just go take a portrait, it was tell his life story. Yeah. Because Teresa, the mom's thought was, I want him to see what he went through when he's 20 years old. And I said, that's why I'll do this, because I want to photograph. We photographed him going to kindergarten a few months back. I want to photograph his high school graduation. I want to mm. photograph his wedding. I want to photograph him as long as I can actually pick up the camera. Wow. And it was an amazing process of Dylan being very standoffish. I mean, these kids are taking in and consuming so many drugs and chemotherapy. There are a lot of mood swings. But finding my way into his heart and, and becoming so connected and that changed my portrait photography overnight. Wow. It, it just, instead of it being, well, let me pose this and turn your head, and you're still working that a little bit, right. but if you do this, it's, it's sort of like this on the fly type portrait. It's not like me just grabbing the camera and all of a sudden, I'm gonna shoot your portrait here, but we're not gonna stage it. You know, we're not gonna set lights up. We're gonna just make it happen as we go. And it's some of the best work I think I've ever done. Wow, wow. Yeah. Boy, that's an emotional tap. I remember, um, long, long time ago when um, Now I Lay Me Down to Sleep first came out. Yeah, my daughter introduced me to them. She's a nurse at Stony and Brook University, uh, Stony Brook Hospital, Children's Hospital. I came out and I thought, well, I couldn't do that. I would cry. And the lady said, there's nothing wrong with crying. That's and I was like, oh, I never thought about that. I just, I didn't want to make it worse by like, well, you know, you, you know. Yeah, it's a good point. You, you kind of try to follow the rules of the house. Well, the rules of the house, you want to be happy all the time. You don't want to take it to another place. I think the thing that I transitioned into and understanding right away is it wasn't about me. Yeah. As soon as you take yourself out of, the, out of no pun intended, the picture, as soon as you take your mind out of the fact that it's, it's not about me, it's not yeah. about my feelings, it's about what am I doing with this photograph to either help drive a donation, help the mom or dad understand, you know, what's gone on and... Um, and capture something that they love. They want to share their pictures. There's not one of these children I know that doesn't have their own Facebook page or uh, a page where they talk about their disease. So they want people to see, you know, what goes on. A lot of the moms carry, you know, cameras or, or, or take pictures during a lot of the procedures. And uh, that's where Dylan's mom, Teresa, had asked me to step in and would you mind doing this and just documenting it over time. And that's where when you're talking about personal projects, how this drummer thing turns into something that I could meld into you know some donations for the Ronald McDonald House which is now turned into a completely different type of personal project the beauty of personal projects is they have no beginning and no end well they have to start somewhere mm -hmm. but you don't think about the beginning until you actually get into it and then once you go through it there's never an end 
I'm just going to keep doing this until I can't take pictures anymore and just trying to do the best job I can of honoring them and giving these kids some dignity. So, uh, so I make portraits that they love or pictures that they love. So nobody's now, seeing the bald heads. Nobody's seeing, you know, the shaves or the cuts or the, you know, the they're scars. They're not seeing them? Because I was just going to try to get into a little... I try to, try to, to disguise that. And sometimes, okay. you know, sometimes you want to keep it real, but I'll try to find an angle that does not have that. Um, okay. a, a little beautiful girl, Zoe, who uh, has a form of brain cancer, as constantly has the tubes going up her nose with the two patches on her face, circular patches on her face. So a lot of times I'll try to hit the other side of the face and do a portrait profile. Okay. But you can't hide or run from what they're facing. Right. And, um, and, and they're okay with it, you know, but I try to do the best job I can to disguise it. Now, so do you do a lot of, like, extreme close-ups? Is that what you mean by that? Or? I, by nature, I just love, when I photograph a portrait in a face, uh -huh. and I'll talk about this tomorrow, uh, but you have to come to the show. But remember, um, we've got a wide audience. That don't, don't all live in southwest Florida, uh, so. Well, <laughs> well, fly in. It's so worth it. I mean, you know, charter a jet, fly yeah. in. Everybody come together, well, you got grab your, a bus, you, you drive You rented overnight. your convertible and everything. Rock and roll bands are in one city one night, and then they're in the next city doing the same exact thing just the like next you. night. Just come. But, uh, <laughs> No, it's uh, I, I like eye contact. It's oh, like you okay. and I right now, we're looking so at each other. So when they, you want them to look into the camera. Yeah, and uh, it doesn't happen always. It doesn't mean you, a great portrait doesn't come from, I think, eye contact alone. It comes from a moment. Uh -huh. You know, uh, again, would I love to photograph you sitting here in your chair? It can make a beautiful picture of you. You could do the same with me. It may be used for certain purposes, but is it really that kind of portrait that tells a story? Or is it a portrait that's just, it's about, you know, how you look? And I'm more on that side of, what story am I telling, okay. you know, by making this portrait, so. All right, so, so walk me through this. So you've got this little girl with the tubes up her nose. Mm -hmm. So you're doing kind of a profile shot. Mm -hmm. You're trying to, to say what? Um, I'm, uh, based on her mom saying, you know, do you, it's okay to have that in the picture, but can you get a few pictures without it? It's trying Just, to accomplish a goal for the mom. you want to show that she's still a beautiful girl? Yeah, you know, people, it's people. And um, yes, she has problems, but... Yeah, ba Bailey had somebody say sir to her. Oh, because you know, she had no hair. Because she had no hair. Oh. Um, there's a beautiful little girl. who I, I asked to marry me. One day she said yes, and then she said no. She's four years old. Her name is Callie. Her mom is Amber. <laughs> Callie has a, something called Faces Disease, P-H-A-C-E-S. Okay. She's got tumors growing from birth inside her face and Ooh. up around the eye region. And it's the way other people react around them that gets them, not how much, you know, they're seeing themselves. It's yeah. not about them seeing themselves. And, you know, a little child went up to Callie once and said, ugh. And, you know, the parent, not that I'm judging, but the parent probably should have said something like, oh, she's beautiful. Um, she's just different. She's beautiful. And that's another challenge. It's just, again, keeping them conscious of it. They're beautiful. They're just beautiful little children. Uh, but it affects them. Right. Even at four years old. Cali, so how do you photograph them. somebody like that? You, you attack it head on. Okay. You really do. You go after it head on because when you let, you, again, we're, I know we're podcasting and some people are only hearing and some people are seeing us and the, the pictures will speak for this, but when she's dancing around a room, Callie dances to any kind of music. That's what you're capturing. So all ah. of a sudden, what may be blemishes or black and blues on the face are lost in this entire picture, not just something so close. I see. I'll go tight on her. But what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to use her little light blue eyes to trigger your connection to the picture. And now all of a sudden when you have a chance to look at it, you may see some black and blues around the cheek. Okay, I see. So it's not always avoiding it. It's sometimes hitting it head on, sometimes hitting that side of Zoe that has that. It really depends on them because you don't have control. I'm not sitting carrying around soft boxes when I do this. Yeah. I'm reacting to them. And so you're taking pictures under these horrible fluorescent lights? I'm taking pictures. At certain times of day, there's one thing about the Ron McDonald House of Long Island is a beautiful glass top ceiling roof. So the, when the light comes through, the especially with blankets. The roof is like a skylight? Of, yeah, in the, the main whole room. Roof? Yep, in, in, oh, the, in, the, in the grand room, the big wow. room. Um, that what is it, Christmas like a big room. old mansion or something? No, or? it's 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 newly built. I mean, oh, oh, um, it's new. I mean okay, it probably it's was old. a structure that was there for a while. I don't know the okay. complete history on it, but um, it's just a beautiful, like an outdoor back patio with wow. a nice. Wow. And so when the lights are soft from the clouds or... You know, I try to do that, try to come in a little earlier. The, the spring shoots, so much better because the light's so much better. Yeah, the fall shoots, not so winter? much. And in those situations, when we're actually doing the portrait projects, I have to carry around a light stand and soft box or umbrella to shoot through. And yeah, because if you're... Just to add light, well, right? Do they have fluorescent lights? Is that what they have yeah, inside? Yeah, they have Because well, those are horrible for people, right? They are. Which, 
you'll probably note that uh, a lot of these pictures, if you do go to the site, the Facebook page for me, it, they're black and white. I was going to say, that's uh, what we do with fluorescent lights. We put them into black and white, we right? We do that <laughs> rock and roll all the time, too. If the light, if the light show is beautiful, you want to kiss the lighting person at a, at a rock show. I mean, you really do. You want to kiss them, huh? You want to kiss them, absolutely. <laughs> because a flat show that is too contrasty is just a nightmare to shoot pictures through, even if you're only shooting three songs or two songs. You want a great picture. Yeah. You know, the, the, the belief, my belief is that what it, wh whatever it is you're photographing, whoever it is you're photographing, it's your job and responsibility to make them look good. You don't want a rock star to, to have a bad picture. Think about your own self. How many mm -hmm. pictures have you seen posted by somebody else? And, 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 and you, you want to go it, back and is kill that them. me? Yeah. Wait a minute. I look fat. It's a bad angle. It's the wrong spot. Why are you shooting me from behind? And uh -huh. you didn't even ask if I could if you could post I that picture. I totally agree. Uh, so <laughs> to me, it's, it's, it's a dedication to and, and I think it's the responsibility of anybody picking up a camera and photographing somebody else to make sure you do the best job you can. Until they say it's a good photo, you know, you have to be a, somebody singing. Dave Matthews, for example, when he hits a high note, his face gets like contorted. All contorted. <laughs> it's just the way it is. It's never going to be a good, beautiful, clean picture when he goes for a high note. But when he's playing the guitar, he's got some good faces. Uh, that kind of stuff is fine. But when you're photographing somebody to make them look good, make them look good. If you don't, throw the pictures away. What benefit is it to post a picture of somebody that makes them look bad? They will never ask you to come back. They'll never hire you for a job. Uh, they'll, they'll never look at you as someone who cares about their interests. Because that's the key to all of this. And whether it's the kids at the house or rock and roll is understand again, you're not the rock star they are. And you're there to Thank make them you. look like a rock star. Thank so, you for saying that. I, I so truth. agree because I tell you, you know, I'm running this photography training center. So, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people say, well, can I come and assist you? And I have a big problem with some people who they seem to think it's about them. Uh, it's uh, not about you. You're there to service the customer. And then the other thing is, and, and this has never happened with anybody personally that I know too well, but there are a lot of people who do event photography. Mm -hmm. And we have a very high society here in Naples, Florida, sure. right? Well, if you make a high society lady, if you put a picture out that doesn't look good, yeah, guess what? It's insulting. It's a small world here yes. in Naples, Florida. you got to make those ladies look good. It's a small world, but like you just said, with this, this uh, channel of the Internet, you know, um, now all of a sudden you go from hundreds of people to thousands oh. of people to tens of thousands of people that are tuning in. Yeah. And, and, and it goes, that's what they call going viral. It's like something like that, you know. Especially yeah, so if celebrity. you have an ugly picture yeah. and, 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 that, and the world sees it, they're not going to like the photographer exactly. too much. So it's, it's who you're serving, exactly. I, like, I love and, that and, attitude. And how, um, how I can make these drummers look great and not get in the way. Why am I firing the cameras remote? Yeah, because you could be standing there. And it's no there. offense, you know, everybody does their own thing, and it's not a judgment again, but nobody's paying for me to see me up on stage. So if I'm walking around a drum kit with a camera with a wide-angle lens, which I see a ton of people do, somebody's paid $200 to see me disrupt the set, and that's not what I'm there for. So uh, if the camera's around the kit, I try to conceal them. Um, and, uh, you know, they're black cameras, so in a black environment, they, they do disguise themselves pretty well unless I have them up at a higher angle than it's obvious that they're there. But uh, the intent is to not be there with them. I will crawl up behind them. I'll stand behind them. Um, if the band goes out front towards the front of the stage and the drummer goes with it, I'll jump, up, jump on the kit to shoot around it. And then, of course, all those remote cameras are firing at me, photographing over at them. So I don't want to lose sight at the show. And I've seen some really bad angles <laughs> of myself with a fish eye. You threw those away, right? <laughs> um, you know what? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no. No, because, you know, I have, I have a thing, and maybe you feel the same way, is uh, I don't throw anything away. It's sort of, a, I think, a habitual thing, whether it's a closet or, you know, uh, the basement or uh, pictures or photos. You know, I always feel like as a teacher that you want a bad example so you can go rifling through some old stuff. And, oh, uh, that's so good, because I yeah. show all my students all my bad pictures. You have to. And yeah. you know what? I, uh, this this uh, the Nikana ambassador, I took classes with Bambi Cantrell. Oh, she's amazing. And right? when I took, I came, I took actually two week-long workshops with mm -hmm. her because she's a really good teacher. Right. So the second time, she just flew in from photographing a wedding, and she put up the pictures, and there were like all these horrible pictures that were like some of the flash didn't go off. Mm -hmm. And that, because I was just starting out, that gave me 
so much encouragement because I thought people like her just press the button and it oh. was a perfect picture every time. <laughs> you hit on a very sensitive thing to me. And it's funny oh. you had mentioned Ron McGill before and going to one of his seminars. It's something we talk about a lot. And it's, some, it's the reason why people like uh, photographers like Joe McNally, for example, or Joe McNally, he teaches you how to make mistakes and correct for them. He teaches you that it's okay to fail. Mm -hmm. I mean, out of the gate, if you trip, you pick it up, you fix it, um, not lose your cool. But he does a lot of live work on, on our stage, Nikon Theater, um, at, at trade shows. He's a good teacher. And, and he'll, a picture will go up there and it's not lit right, and he'll explain why. And that humanizes him, for one. Yeah. It makes people realize that even Joe McNally makes mistakes, but it's the best feature about him as a person. It's the best thing about him as a person is that um, he's approachable. And I think anybody that puts himself up on a level that is more unapproachable, you always say to yourself that, can I really do what they do? Right. The reality is, is you can. Yeah. What's the commitment? What's the dedication level? How deep are you willing to go? How early are you willing to get up in the morning? You know? It was you. You know, I have been quoting you, oh, <laughs> and no. I couldn't remember who said it. I probably took it from somebody else anyway. No, because <laughs> when you spoke here, I don't know, when were you, did you I speak in Naples? I spoke here about four or five times, but yeah. Anyway, when I saw, I only saw you speak here once, and were you, you said, yes, okay, good. that's why you're here. <laughs> I, I didn't stink, right? <laughs> you were great. All right, good. But you said um, something about you have to make sacrifices to get, the good pictures or something yeah, like that. Yeah. And I've been saying that, and I'm like, I can't remember I who I heard you, that I, from. I it was you. I'm not the first person to say that, and, and probably not the first person to say you should be making pictures while most, most people, while most people are eating or sleeping, mm. because that's where the best light's gonna be. You know, it's, it's, everybody's got their thing, but if you think you're gonna wake up at 11 o'clock in the afternoon and go photograph out in Moab, it's not gonna happen. You know, um, you'll make pictures, but you're not gonna make great pictures. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference between you know, somebody who's doing this for hobby and just wants to say they've been to a place and document that, there's nothing wrong with that. But as you start to grow and you say to yourself, I want to get serious about this game. I want to be really great with photography, even if it's just to put pictures online or, or hang photos on your walls, which, I mean, that's what I still love. I, I see them around the studio. And, and, I do uh, too. You know, uh, to me, hanging a picture and just going back to look at that time and time again, bring that memory back is what it's all about. But, you know, you have to, you have to, you have to put the time in. Um, sacrifice is sacrifice. Sleep deprivation is probably the number one issue with most photographers. Um, although some find a way to get around. I've, I've been working with really amazing landscape photographer Mandy Lay, a young lady who has a trailer, and that's her way around. She's got the car in the front, she's dragging it, she goes wherever she goes, she stops wherever she stops, she t shoots pictures, and she travels around the country. It's, it's amazing. Um, something maybe I'll do at some point down the road. Yeah. Are you your know? kids grown? My kids are grown, 24 and 25. There so, you go. Yes, I am, I am free uh, to kind of roam around the country, I guess, or around the world. I just don't have any time to travel I know. Yet, well, so. you got a job. Well, yeah, listen. But you got a good Nikon job, but it's a job. First. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Listen, it, there's, there's no doubt, and I can say it and scream it out loud every day, without Nikon and my dad and mom, I wouldn't really be where I am. Dad starts a dark room at home. You get the itch. You become passionate about it. I start making pictures in college and, and high school and college and all of a sudden you know one day my dad comes to me with an ad in the newspaper back in the day remember one ads yes sure I do <laughs> has no Probably clue what a one ad is <laughs> um, and, um, <sighs> and there was a one ad and an opportunity to work at Nikon and I went in and because of my dad I got the job and 35 years later I'm here and been through probably about uh, nine different jobs at Nikon and then landed in marketing and a pro relations job and built this program called the Ambassador Program with people like Bambi and Corey Rich and Amy Vitale, some of the top photographers, Joe McNally, in the world. But the beauty of them is they're mentors. Mm -hmm. And unless, to me, it's about mentoring, it's really trying to motivate people and inspiring people yeah. to try to pick up a camera and realize the potential. Is everybody going to be great? Well, it's relative to who that person is right and Ron McGill another ambassador says all the time if a picture makes you smile and you took it you should be happy with that photo yeah that's a great photo so everything is you know based on perspective but um, without Nikon I couldn't be doing the things that I'm doing I yeah. couldn't be. but again it's dedicating time to that making sure that job is done and then finding time but it's you have to make changes in life too the older I got I used to teach spin in the morning go to Nikon all day and then shoot a concert at night 
during the summer months wow. when the, the, the season of concert was going, concerts were going on. I purposely gave up the working out because Nikon comes first, uh, the concerts would come second, and then at least I could get some sleep in the morning, you know, uh, and you then get up and go to work. You've got to take care of your body. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll catch up with that at some point. Well, I, I was taking care of my body. I've got a trainer and everything now, and I just blew out my calf two days ago. So oh, no. It's the truth. It's the truth. Oh. I, it's, I'm not a sob story. It's okay. Oh. I'll get back in there, and we'll do now, other Now, what things. about, now you have, okay, so you're, are you pretty much a nine to five or at Nikon? It doesn't seem like that's your. There's no your, such thing as nine to five anymore. I was going to say you know, it's it seven seem in the morning till six thirty. Because seven you do conventions for them, you speak. I you yeah, it, it's we, we produce, we direct, we you know the the job has become so versatile and and so different these days that there's no such thing as a job description that you follow anymore. Everybody contributes. Everybody's got to jump in and. And I, I work with a great marketing team at Nikon, about uh, really great eight people, eight or nine people. And we all kind of come together and just say, okay, we got this project. doesn't matter where we are, what level of career we are, we're at, what our title is or rank. Everybody jumps in and everybody picks a piece of it to, okay. to work on. And like these big shows coming up at the consumer electronics shows, everybody's got a hand in promoting it and setting up the website and producing it. And, Reaching out to the talent and, and setting up contracts. And you said you're going to live stream from there, right? We're going to live stream from CES. And that will be on the NikonUSA.com? Yes, Nikon, NikonUSA.com uh, live, backslash live. Okay. And, and the programs will live there um, after CES as well. That's so cool. But it, when you do a trade show, you typically we working with about six or seven different photographers. When you talk about a production like this, we came together and uh, it's going to be 34 unique programs over four days with 28 different speakers. Wow. Yeah, some very powerful women speaking, some really game-changing photographers like James Baylog in conservation, Amy Vitale with her uh, wildlife conservation efforts. Um, there's a beautiful, uh, very, very talented woman, um, a veteran, Stacy Pearsall, who's got a project called the Veterans Portrait Project. Okay. Um, and, and she'll be speaking there as well. So there's a lot of great talent, a lot of variety. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to touch somebody, whether you're into photographing you know, sports or action or uh, portraits or making movies, videos. We have somebody, you know, speaking and you on all And you personally do all of this stuff. Um, sometimes, yeah. <laughs> I mean, no, okay, for me, most of my training is in portrait photography. Mm -hmm. And when I say most, I mean many, many, many years mm -hmm. of it, right? But then when I started teaching, my students are more nature photographers. Mm -hmm. So I had to start learning nature okay. photography, and it is a whole different world. But do, you, do you feel like you're good at everything? No. No. Because <laughs> it, it's not real. To me, and it's what you would say, it's what every instructor would say, is find something you love and photograph it. When you love something and you photograph it, you're more likely to just jump in and understand it more and want to be a part of it more. But um, you know what I did, what it has done for me, it's made me better at every, like even portrait or weddings or mm -hmm. whatever, because I have this much broader knowledge about photography now mm -hmm. than I did before I was like very specific, you know, I can tell you how to move the lights and, you know, all that other kind of stuff for... Yeah, you know, for different, me, you know, you want Rembrandt lighting, you want this, you want that, but now it's like, oh, let's try to do a long exposure and do a zoom blur, and I never did stuff like that in portrait photographer, you, mm -hmm. you know, so now you kind of mix it up, it's, it's more fun. It is, and, and, and to me, the art is, you know, from the camera's point of view, yes, you can do a lot of in post-production, but, you know, I want to craft and create in the camera. When you talk about having no time, I don't spend a lot of time, you know, in editing, um, okay. I just don't have that time. If you're photographing a band and you're trying to post pictures within minutes after the third song, so Live Nation has something to post, you're not doing a lot of editing. Oh, you're doing wow. a quick crop, quick exposure adjustment. So is that what you do? You, yeah. So you take the pictures? Every show, every And are group. you, but you're not tethered to your computer. No, I just. So um, you take those cards and you put them in the computer? No, no. You can actually, the camera communicates with your mobile device or your tablet. Okay. So, um. Uh, a camera like the D750, for example, I can just can communicate directly from the camera to my send the picture. my tablet. And uh, I mean, I send, you decide I which pictures. I take the pictures I want. I transfer them over. Okay. I do a quick edit um, with editing software, and I transmit them just like a text. Wow. You know, someone's waiting in their office for these pictures to come, and uh, they'll post a, a few right away, and then they'll post a gallery the now next day. Now, is this is are you getting paid for this? Yeah, there's compensation. Okay, okay. And, this is not a volunteer for, project. For, forms a compensation, and um, 
you know, it's not, always, it's not always it's about It's not cash. as much fun, though, when you... No, it's, it's a job. Yeah. It's a job, but my daughter benefits a lot from it. So Because um, she likes the rock and roll. She loves the rock she and roll. She gets to meet she all loves, the famous she, people. <laughs> she loves to come out there and go to shows and go to the country shows and go into the pit, things I would never do. Oh, yeah. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, you know, listen, in this business, you have to make everything of value. Um, if you're going to stand up and make a business work, I'm very fortunate to be at Nikon for 35 years. I never take that for granted. But if, if I'm going to go out there and photograph someone in rock and roll and I'm not making money, it's my time to learn and to be connected. They're going to pay somehow, and if they pay the Ronald McDonald House, that that's sweet to me. Right. Um, you know, uh, listen, I don't know any photographer that ever got into this to get rich. Yeah. They got into it to follow a passion or run a business and run a successful business, and it's a really tough thing to do these days. Yes, it you is. You know, holding on to clients and 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 making the big paychecks, commercial paychecks that you used to make. You know, in days past, but people are doing it. Yeah. And again, I, I am always, I'm always inspired by the people around us. And, and Amy Vitale said it too: is that this is a time to embrace photography. There's a lot of change. Let's find the new ways of doing things. Let's figure out the new avenues to sell pictures. Let's let's use the pictures to tell these stories about everything going on in wildlife, and and just keep working at it and working at it. And as you probably know, a lot of photographers sacrifice and use their own money to mm -hmm. fund their own projects. Yep. And then they'll find maybe somebody to back that later on. But um, to run a business is tough. But if you have business savvy and you run it the right way, you can. Yeah. You know, yeah. especially if you find you know the customer base that you're looking for. Um, you know, uh, wedding photography is amazing uh, to run a business in, especially locally. Um, you know, for somebody that wants to work with their local community um, and do weddings, um, it's a great way to. Not to, here. To here. <laughs> we don't have our, our weddings are all destination weddings here. That's not, not all so of them. Bad. But I wouldn't most mind of them. going to uh, <laughs> some of those beautiful like Nassau and the Bahamas and it's, Cuba. It's and, beautiful here. Yeah. We we are so blessed. I mean, we have sunset on the beach mm -hmm. with the white sand, and yeah. it is it's it's fabulous. It really is. Yeah, it's uh, but, but uh, it's uh, but it's not a local type of thing. Mm -hmm. Not at least not if you want to make money at Nobody it. Nobody gets married in Florida. That's just so sad. Everybody gets married in Florida. <laughs> but they and have to I'm go happy. somewhere. <laughs> But, uh, you know, it's, um, it's trying to fit it all in, and uh, and again, I, I wish there was some things I would say that, oh, no, I didn't sacrifice anything. It was always, it's always rosy and perfect, but you adjust your life to find the time to do what you have to do, and um, yes, now that the kids are grown, um, I still find time. Now, does your wife, them. is she into photography at all? I, I don't have a wife. Oh, I thought you were married. I'm so sorry. I was at one point. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. She's the mother of my children, and she's a beautiful lady. Um, so but, you uh, really are free. Yes. Yes. And, and, you know, listen, you, you take your path in life, and, and to me, the photography was not something that I found. It was, it was, it's in the DNA, and my father helped me find it. Um, and, and I'm not ashamed to say that I'm addicted to it. Um, I, I can't wait to make the next picture. Now, let me, let me ask you about another, yet, yet another project you have, something about the birds. Yeah, the birds of Stony Brook. Um, birds of Stony Brook. I think this is the one that caused a divorce, but um, <laughs> oh, it's okay. I, I found a, uh, a love affair with a lake okay. in Stony Brook, New York. And that's how far away from you? It, before divorce, it was about 15 minutes, 10 minutes. Now it's about 30, 40 minutes, but okay. it's worth it to go back there. Um, it, is a, it was a lake that I thought at first had just swans and ducks and Canada geese and um, and and I realized it was enriched with all kinds of species of birds okay. cormorants and heron and great blues uh, and the more I went to the lake the more I'd find them and then it became this weird amazing addiction to have to go there at just the right times like we were talking about before nobody's around the sun's coming up and all of a sudden these birds would come out of places that I had no clue of course no one's around the birds come out it's right in Stony Brook proper, so the more cars that come, and then they start throwing kayaks in the water, and oh, you know these yeah. uh, what they call these boards that just stand on. Oh these yeah, the stand up boards, stand up, stand up paddle boards. Whatever, paddle boards. <laughs> Sup. <laughs> yeah, and, and so during the summer months, when most of the birds are there, and it's it's rich with more species, um, um, it's just something I, I, I started going to about uh, again. About, I'm going to say about seven years ago. And the next thing I knew, I was addicted. I had to keep going. So you going like got back. up before dawn. Like how many? I was like tracking. I was every walking. Week? I was counting my steps. I would every weekend. Every weekend. I wow. couldn't tell you how many times I heard you have to go back to that lake again. <laughs> but that's what happens. And it's on the way from Nikon. On the way home, it was so. 
if I just took a detour, I'll be home in five minutes, and that never was the case. Oh no! Once you get out five there, five minutes, five hours. You can't you can't tell wildlife when to go. Yeah, you know, yeah. or when to come and when to stand in front of the camera. So it was all bird photography, is what it's all you? bird photography, and I'm still doing it. And again, a project like that just never ends. I'll just yeah. keep going back, and I'm not uh, I'm not going to avoid it during the winter. I found some of my best pictures during the winter. Really? How but you cool. just adjust. I, you know, I I never thought a seagull could be so beautiful. But it's the only bird, along with the geese and the swans, you know, in the, in the winter. Yeah. And the ducks, of course, the beautiful ducks. I mean, I just, uh, and, and as I say in my programs, sorry, ladies, but the male ducks are always more beautiful. Yeah. Of, of <laughs> well, birds species. in general, the, male, the males are usually <laughs> more beautiful. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's something that I got into and, and just started going. All of a sudden, as I started recognizing the species and I started digging in, what do we do? We go research. I, I would research the tide levels. I would understand as we're experiencing here in Florida, I guess from the hurricanes, how it's kind of killed wildlife photography in a lot of areas like the Everglades because the water is too high. Yeah. There's no pools or no areas in low tides where the fish are trapped so the birds have nothing to feed I off went of out and they got to find it. Last um, Saturday, mm -hmm. actually with my guest from last week, I, we took her out into the Everglades and the birds were like all in one spot. Mm -hmm. It was so weird. I have yeah. never seen that. Were thousands and thousands of herons and storks and mm -hmm. ibises, or is it ibis? Ibis. I, the ibis. I, I, I question it every time. Kind of like and a I gotta, to me, the ibis. I, it's not a pretty but bird. But is it plural? But, oh, I, I don't love know. Ibises. Ibis with a. I, I don't know. But I don't know if it's plural. But anyway. <laughs> That's when I call Ron McGill, honestly. Yeah, he would know. Ron, what is that bird? What did you call that? Oh, my gosh. I just had, had some amazing bird photography. I've learned so much about bird photography from this show. <laughs> it's but hard. Bird, bird photography, photography is hard. I was doing sports photography for a long time, and I wish I would have started with birds because uh, they are so difficult to photograph. They and are. And they teach you patience. And Because um, you have no, at least with sports, you kind of can tell which way they're going to go, mm -hmm. and your but lighting you, doesn't really change as much, right? right. You with birds... The lighting changes. The lighting changes. A white bird study is different than a black bird, yeah, right? Yeah. I'm photographing and. But but when you study birds, I, I was studying the cormorants pretty heavy, and I always knew when a bird's going to take off. Not because I'm a genius, but when a, let's just say they're nesting and they're pulling twigs out from the water, as soon as they come up with a twig in the mouth, give it maybe 15 seconds and that bird's up in the air. Okay. So, you know, you, you learn their habits and you learn what their behaviors are so you do predict. Like I said before, if you love something, you know about it. If you love baseball, photograph baseball, you're going to know the game of baseball to predict what's going to happen next. Okay. Um, you know, if you know cormorants, you're going to understand that when they do certain things, they're going to go. Right. Um, and, um, and they're going to make pictures for you. Is it perfect? No. <laughs> but that's the beauty of it. How many times you spend Once hours and get nothing, and you get there, and within 10 minutes, you've made 10 pictures. I mean, it's just so unpredictable, but that's the beauty of it. To me, when you go to certain parts of the lake, I couldn't hear cars. I couldn't oh. hear you know, street traffic noise, um, and that's what I enjoyed about the lake the most. You walk the paths, and you shoot from different directions, and, you know, yes, you could hear planes and stuff going up overhead, but, you know, you don't yeah, hear you all live of in those New York. ambient sounds. That's what I yeah. feel. That's how I feel about the Everglades. Mm -hmm. I, I am like in heaven out there. Yeah, yeah. Well, you hear stuff. Sometimes scary stuff. We, I saw my first python out there. Oh, nice. Because, <laughs> you, Cause did you know, what? we have a terrible problem <laughs> with pythons here. And, uh, oh, my f crazy friend Chris Hopkins, mm -hmm. he tried to pick it up. Okay. And what was the result of this? Struck at him, missed him, thank God. But then we reported it so that they can come. Because they're, you know, they hunt those. They're terrible for the Everglades. They're oh, killing all New all York, the there's another species called the rat. There's <laughs> plenty of those. Not where I live, but. Um, no, it's, uh, yeah, so. That could so, be a project someday. The rats the, of New York. I, I think, I don't think my plate will handle another project, but I think, if anything, it's just going to be focused on these kids at the Ronald McDonald House and figuring out ways of just continuing I to I love get back that, at. that you kind yeah. of put those together. Yeah, it's, you have to, um, you have to figure out how it all works, and then you have to figure out how to sleep. But I'd rather not sleep if I have an opportunity, you know, with one of these kids or they're going to a hospital. And, We've been very successful with uh, this young boy, Dylan, in going to the uh, Cohen's Children's Hospital, which is right next to Ron McDonald House, and bringing cameras in. And you ask permission, and they were very open. And there's some places, um, like in New York City, the hospital uh, uh, that, that they're going to now, um, it's just not, it says right at the front door, no okay. cell phones, no cameras, no anything. Yeah. And you have to respect those rules. Right, right. Because yeah, e even if you did put a picture out there, 
let's just say you caught a nice picture somewhere, it goes out on the internet, the people from that establishment are going to see it, and the first thing they're going to do is they're going to stop you at the door the next time you try to come yeah, in. You respect yeah. the rules, you're more likely to get in. And then you just got to try to ask the question, how many times or how many different ways can you ask the question about getting done what you need to do? Um, you, you can't just walk into every band and start shooting. Right. Now, back in the day, 30, 40 years ago, if you had a camera, they thought you were a member of the band. Nowadays, you have to work through layers of management, you have to work through performers. Typically, when the performer is who I'm connected to, it's carte blanche, it's open. But if you have to work through layers of management, it just creates these stone walls and it just makes it harder to do the job. Yeah. And at this stage of my life, if it's not easy, I don't really want to engage right. you know, in a crazy situation. Right. Give me my room, tell me what the rules are, I'll follow them. I never look to break any rules, and that's another bit of advice I give to people. If someone sets a rule, there's a reason for it. Live with it and work around it until you can get to a place where you say, hey, wait a minute, if I tried to do it this way, will you let me do it? And he's, well, okay, if you do it that way, then it's okay. Yeah. But try to find your place and try and, try and get to the place where you can make the kind of picture that you, you want. How, you, how do you sell that? Make beautiful pictures of these artists. They love it. Hey, can you do this with me now? Can you try this next time? Well, wait a minute. You told me I wasn't allowed to do that. Oh, no, no. It's okay. Yeah. If you can get this picture, then it's okay to do that. Okay. And that's how you end up with cameras around drum kits. It's pretty I think insane. that's so cool. Yeah. I, I wondered about that. And then, of course, no, I saw your whole presentation when you talked about the drummer love and all the mm -hmm. different, you had the pictures of the different cameras around right. there. And I knew you were remote triggering, which I've never done, so I was interested in that. One other thing you said that I, that I found interesting is that you used center-weighted metering. Mm -hmm. And I never knew anybody who used center-weighted metering, and maybe it's just that I don't understand, okay, why? Why do you use center-weighted metering? It's a great question. Um, why and, wouldn't you use evaluative metering or, or even spot metering? It's, it's or, a, it's I'm sorry, it's matrix question. metering, Nikon. <laughs> no, spot, there's, spot, there's, se there's several different meters in the oh. Nikons, and matrixes are uh, uh, overall reads the entire right. scene kind of metering. It, it's, it's accurate. I mean, it is ridiculously accurate. And it's where most people will set the camera. But imagine you're on a stage. Uh -huh. What's in the background? Your son's a performer. It's black. It's dark. Right. What meter is going to play with that well at all? So when I put these cameras on the drum kit, I'm playing the percentages. I'm mm -hmm. playing the best percentage I can ever work with. So the beauty of cameras like the D850 or the D5, you can actually vary the size of the center-weighted circle. You can? Yes. Yeah, so I'm actually going to, oh from my God, I didn't you know, know that. 16 millimeters, 8 millimeters, I'm going to crunch it down to an even smaller center-weighted just so I'm targeting at so the drummer. So it's almost like spot Correct. metering, but bigger. Right, because what's going to happen is that unless there's lights or structures around the stage that are lit in the background dominating the areas outside the drummer, that black is going to influence the meter. So If you're in matrix meter. Yes, okay. and, and so I avoid that, not because the meter doesn't work, it just doesn't work in that situation. The spot meter might be too tight. If the drummer's moving in a piece of black or a piece of white or something that can fool that meter you know, in such a small degree, um, hits the, the, the meter area, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose exposure right. that way. So there was no science to this except experimenting and just learning. And um, the, again, kiss the lighting person because if the light is clean and it's, it's plentiful, then you got beautiful light. Um, when I photographed uh, Tommy Lee of Motley Crue, he had a re crazy roller coaster kit and he went upside down and we mounted I've cameras to this I've seen your pictures on <laughs> that. That's but pretty cool. <laughs> the light on him, it, the, the drummer has to be lit. And yeah. if there's no light on the drummer, these pictures don't look good at all. So it's just, it's working around, it's trying to find it, but he also had LCD panels behind him. They had light structures in front of him, so he was surrounded by light. You've got to make good pictures that way. But center weight of metering, two-thirds of a stop down, just to drop down the exposure, a little more density to the exposure, and so, you're so it doesn't blow out as okay. much. Because the, the light's moving. The percentages, and you shoot an aperture priority? Aperture priority, right. I want to let the camera run. What do you put your aperture run. at? Uh, it depends. on Fisheye lens, you really don't have to go beyond f4, but I push it to f6.3, uh, uh, 7.1. And why do I do that? <laughs> because I have a D5 that can shoot at 12,800 ISO, and I'm trying to generate wow. the fastest shutter speeds I possibly can. So I'm using astronomical ISOs with the D5, and that's giving me the freedom to close the lens down a little bit more. Again, if you focus a fisheye in the right spot, everything is sharp. Right. But if you miss it when you're that close to something, you could blow it out. And when, if you lose a camera to focus, the entire take from that camera is gone. So you have to be pretty critical with the focus as wow. well. But it's all manual, taped down. 
you know. That is so once cool. You set it. Yeah. Now, what's next for Mike Corrado tomorrow? Tomorrow, nine a.m. At, at, at this beautiful camera club in Naples. And, Dippy um, Sig. Dippy Sig. <laughs> got, it's not got, easy to remember. I that, right? so, right. See what they don't know is I couldn't say that like before this all started. Fifteen <laughs> times we tried. Um, no, um, it's oh. it's really uh, getting to the holidays, uh, and uh, I'll be emceeing the programs at CES, so I'll come up and I'll oh, introduce wow. the people and okay. talk to the crowd, and it's just something that I've I'm sort of watch evolved you into in a role. <laughs> Trust me, it's not as exciting as the photographers <laughs> that are actually presenting, but um, but CES, the, the trade show circuit from the beginning of the year, uh, the CES show, the WPPI show, Wedding Portrait Professional mm -hmm. Photographers International, um, is another big show, but uh, for me on the photography front, it's just sort of like keep going. Uh, the next drummer, th this is the beauty of it, and again, it's... My friends will say I'm name dropping, and I don't care. But <laughs> you make friends with these people; they become your friends. Of course, and, they're um, just people. So, and you talk about dedication and passion. Um, uh, this guy Chuck drums for Billy Joel. Billy mm -hmm. Joel keeps a lot of local talent. Chuck Berge is his name, and he plays for a, a bunch of different bands. And I've always thought if I got the drummer immersed in the project and understanding what goes on, Chuck was one of the first drummers to ever come to me and say, "I use a white drum kit." Because when the lights gels, when the when the gels change from red to blue to the green, it changes the color of my kit. Oh, that's And I thought cool. that was pretty fascinating. And Chuck and I hit it off when I was photographing him with a much smaller band on Long Island. He'll play for four or five bands. He doesn't care. He just loves to play like you and I pick up a camera to uh -huh. shoot. And so he called me a month ago. I guess he would be the next drummer I'm going to work with. Uh, he's changing over his kit, new sponsor. He wants all new pictures. So... Um, if Chuck is going to make his donation to the Ron McDonald House, which I've already asked him to do, uh, they, again, who would turn that down? I know. That's, who would turn that's that down? And, and I don't put a limit on it. And I, I have to throw out props to even some of the younger artists I was work, I, I've been working with. And um, this young artist, Noah Jessup, he's an amazing guitarist. He launched his own album. He produced it. He put it online. And uh, he asked me to do a photo shoot for him. And uh, next thing I know, I get a card in the mail. It's, a donation in your name was made by Noah Jessup. Kid's 21 years old and he dropped $300 in a donation. I, I don't mind saying that because he's just, he's, you know, and you struggle with some people in life just worried about giving $10 over. And I'm not, listen, again, $5, $10, it doesn't matter. I don't tell them what to put out there. Mm -hmm. But when that card came to me, I was like, you, you're just sitting there in tears because you just, you know, you affected somebody. You're helping him. Maybe he's the next Bruce Springsteen. I don't know. Yeah, he's, he's really, really talented. And, um, you know, so, so that's what makes it all worth it. Um, Going back to the house probably Christmas Day. Um, if there are families there and we want to make some photos, I've got nothing to do Christmas Day. I'm with my family Christmas Eve. My daughter's working, so my son's up in Boston, and I will be uh, probably back at the house that day or meeting with Dylan, uh, who's going. Sadly, I don't know uh, if you celebrate Christmas or he's got to go into the house for a procedure on the 26th, so he's going to the Ron mm -hmm. McDonald House in New York City. So, oh, so he's not going to be in the Long Island one. No, nope. so I may travel with them into the city to do that. Okay. I don't know. So that could be the next thing. I don't know. That just came up last night. I just remembered. So. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's, wow. You're doing so, I love to hear when people are doing good things with their photography, you know? Everybody should. I mean, and, and again, that's not a judgment. It's just when you get to this place and you're as blessed as I am to do what I've done for 35 years, who sustains a career for 35 years? But to do it through Nikon, which is one of the most amazing companies out there, mm. um, and celebrating 100th and how many companies have been around for 100 years I know. and still doing the job well? And, uh, and then through Nikon being connected to Live Nation, through Nikon being connected to the Ronald McDonald House, and to me, I've always believed you make of it what you can. If you, if you want something to happen, you know, make it happen and, and try. It doesn't always work out. But to get the opportunity to photograph these portraits, now, not only has Dylan's mom asked me to follow him, Callie, Amber's, uh, Amber Callie's mom asked me to take pictures. And we do this. They come in, I'm there. Of course, it always starts off with uh, about 30 minutes of a beat down where What's they're beating mean? me up. Um, huh? First thing you learn is put the camera down, connect with them. Okay. We'll talk about this tomorrow uh, if you come to the show. Uh, but um, it's not always about taking the picture. It's about connecting with yeah. them as, as kids and I'm kind of a... 55-year-old big kid rolling <laughs> around on the floor. Men never grow up. They just grow old. Now, I'm not going to say that, <laughs> that, that statement out there that could get me in trouble. I, 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 I don't know about, I know about me. <laughs> I know that when I get in there and Dylan wants to go at it, we go at it. 
and we'll wrestle for a few minutes, Aww. and in between, I'll shoot, I'll shoot pictures. That's so and cool. And a lot of times, the camera will end up on the floor, and, and we're rolling around, and, and um, uh, I don't let him win. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> all uh, the but time. he tries, but it's nice when Callie and Dylan and, and Zoe, they them. all jump on top at the same time. You found a real passion there. Oh, God, yeah. Now, your website is? Uh, the website's www.coradophotography.com. Uh, CoradoPhotography.com and Corrado Photo on Facebook. On Facebook. That's, that's where Instagram. I tend to plant most of the pictures. Instagram is Corrado Photography. Corrado Photography. Yes, people out there learn, <laughs> as we talked before, don't change your name for two seconds because somebody will eat it. Okay. Somebody will take somebody it. Somebody stole your name. Someone stole my name. I can't believe it. That's okay. Now, um, remember, audience, to check the show notes. We will have this on YouTube probably Saturday, Sunday, and it's also going to be on iTunes as a podcast. Our show notes will be on understandphotography.com. Heather does a great job. She types up, so we'll, we'll have the links to Mike's website and his Facebook and his Instagram, um, maybe some pictures. Maybe you would share sure. some pictures Absolutely. with us that we can share on the, on the, in the show notes. Mm -hmm. And while you're on our, on our website on understandphotography.com, just remember there are hundreds of teaching articles on our website and our motto at Understand Photography is we simplify the technical. So if you are the kind of person who likes things kind of given to you in a step-by-step, -step, simple, you know, not too much techie stuff, you will like our teaching style. So read some of the articles there. Next week on the Understand Photography show, my guest will be photographer Beth Reynolds. Um, she's with the more I'm not sure how to say it, Morian, I'm going to say, Morian Art Center in St. Petersburg, Florida. So we're going to talk about some of the photography opportunities there and also about some of Beth's work. So tune in here to the Understand Photography Facebook page at 4 p.m. Eastern Time on Friday if you want to watch it live. If you can't make it live, we put it on YouTube and as a podcast. For me, I like to listen to podcasts in the car. That's kind of my thing. It's just easier. And check us out at understandphotography.com. I'm Peggy Farron. Thank you for watching episode number 66 of the Understand Photography Show. We'll see you next week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Understand Photography Show. It would help us immensely if you would click like down below and subscribe to our channel. Thanks so much. We really want to continue to bring awesome photographers onto the Understand Photography Show.